sports and more. Uh, pretty good sized activity in Vanuatu today. We're going to have a look at that. We're also going to have a look at responses of Yellowstone faults. Um, and there's a lot of activity north and south of Yellowstone. Uh, some in the uh, some in Yellowstone as well. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite busy. We uh, we had some other reactions elsewhere um, in the Gulf of Mexico, around the edge of the Gulf of Mexico as well. Some sites down there. So we'll have a look at those in a little bit. Um, first, we give we dedicate this program to our Heavenly Father's service. So we'll stop for a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can again come before you still able to communicate and still able to share the truth that you give us um, the very important truth of salvation that uh, all will be shaken um, so that they will choose we thank you Jesus that uh, you're here to shepherd us that you guide us and we thank you Holy Spirit for the gifts that you bring in Jesus name we pray amen and so let's begin with Vanuatu. This is the location of the earthquake. It doesn't show very large. It's right where the cursor is, right the uh, middle of the screen, right there. And we're going to zoom in on that. And there it is. Um, some big faults in the area of Vanuatu. Um, a lot of volcanic islands, uh, sea mounts, etc. Uh, a lot of plate margins. Let's have a quick look at those plate margins. And here we see one big ridge with an accompanying trench, of course. And I believe this is Tonga out in this area. Um, Fiji, I think, is here. And over, um, anyway, uh, very, very significant plate margins in the area. Um, I don't know this area super well, so I'm not going to try and describe it very accurately to you, but uh, I'm more, I'm try to be more accurate with the earthquakes themselves than uh, the plates that are in the South Pacific. Um, but uh, one day we'll pull up a plate, plate map for this area and uh, it's worth a look. So the, uh, the sites that we're showing this earthquake from are over here in the Solomon Islands and down south in um, New Zealand, right near Wellington, uh, south end of the North Island. So lots of plate margins in the area. And we get a lot of deep earthquakes in that area. Um, deep earthquakes, uh, scientists have made recent discoveries that there's actually a compression of matter that it becomes denser at great depths and with heat and this can initiate a collapse situation which sends a shock wave up and with all of these uh, plates subducting in the area we've uh, there's some understanding that uh, this plate material is sinking um, deep into the crust over time and that's uh, or into the below the crust in the asthenosphere and in, um, and deeper yet and uh, that's what is apparently triggering the onset of all of these earthquakes. So kind of an interesting aside. Compression, deep, deep compression, like 600, 700 kilometers deep underneath. Uh, compressing matter, making it denser and causing uh, subsequent earthquakes. Here we are looking at, um, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, Paniara. Um, Solomon Islands, and this is 600 miles away. All right, 600 miles away. We're going to. Do, uh, I'm going to zip down because I, this is one that I have a little bit out of order. And we'll look at uh, South Karori site. This is uh, close to Wellington, and this is showing uh, the earthquake from 1,900 miles away. So Solomon Islands um, was 600 miles away. This is 1,900 miles away. This is three times further away, yet it sh um, over three times further away, yet it shows a larger signal. Uh, that's telling us that this is on the pathway of the, uh, the force flow from the earthquake. Um, earthquakes have a force flow direction. 
They don't spread out equally. They, uh, they use a tensor ball often to describe it, but essentially there was a north-south earth um, force flow with this earthquake. Now, we're not using that one for a measurement. We're just looking at the size. And so we come back up here, and let's uh, start sorting out what this earthquake actually is. And when we look at, uh, from the observatory, and where is this? This is Oak Ridge, Massachusetts. We see that we have a coarse wave signal through here and a secondary um, higher frequency signal here. So this is a deep signal. This is a shallow signal. So now we're starting, just starting, to get an understanding. Um, this is the P wave leading into it here. You can just see this here. It's uh, mixed into the other signals a little bit, but the first signals to arrive are P wave signals. And then it gets into a very, very deep coarse wave form here. We don't see the uh, start of this necessarily, or it's not clearly defined. But this, uh, this coarse wave form we're going to see is, uh, is very close to eight minutes in duration. That's, uh, that's pretty significant. So very, very coarse, less coarse, and higher frequency showing the very close together lines. You need a, a large screen to see this well, but uh, hopefully by seeing uh, gray versus black, you can have some understanding that there's many, many more lines in that um, higher frequency signal. When we look from Johnson Island, now we're going to the uh, north uh, northwest, and this is probably in the neighborhood of uh, 2,000 plus, maybe 3,000 miles away. Um, we're seeing a little bit, this is obscured. We're, we're not seeing this very well, but we're seeing that there's three signals, and uh, this secondary signal looking from Johnson Island seems to be the largest one. We'll continue looking to see if that is, in fact, the case. Now we look from Kivo, Finland, and we again see a very large signal in this area. Um, then it uh, changes into a deep signal. Here we're starting to see a split of the what is now the, looking like the third earthquake. That would make this to be four earthquakes. And so I went to uh, San Pablo, Spain, and the deep earthquake is actually uh, longer than I initially measured. It's, uh, it's about eight minutes. And we're looking at that deep earthquake right in here, um, seven and a half minutes, roughly. But we take uh, half a minute off for distance because distance will spread out a signal, even uh, even a deep signal. We'll get a little bit longer over distance. Um, so we'll uh, knock a little bit of time off this, call that a seven minute uh, episode. Now when we look at this width of a single S wave set, and we're saying it's deep and it's very large, why is it looking so short if it's such a big signal? Um, this is caused by depth. Depth decreases the amplitude of the signal shown by the seismogram. Um, when we get off to the side, we can uh, see, we see this signal much better from San Pablo, Spain than we do from other sites. We also see that it's clearly defined that we have a, a more shallow earthquake that followed this very, very deep signal. But of all of these, now that they're all spread apart, this is not the largest signal here. This is actually the largest signal here. It's hidden by the depth, which makes it look to be of very little consequence. In fact, we had a very large, very deep, over 400 kilometers deep earthquake in Vanuatu. Um, that was about a 7.9 based on S wave size, and then we'll um, have a look at propagation beyond that. But we also had other earthquakes that were a good size. This is at least a, um, a, a low seven. It's, this is in the low seven range. Um, and then we had, uh, uh, this is probably a five five. I haven't looked at these closely, but we had a, a, it's a series event earthquake yet again. And we had small earthquakes leading into this. This, was, this isn't just P wave coming up to this earthquake. These are small events as well, and they include uh, some at great depth. So there was a lot of uh, movement leading into this earthquake, and it was certainly a series event. We can see this from um, Pohakuloa, 
Hawaii, um, we see that there was a large event here. We see great width between the signals here. So hiding in this, um, we see that there's a few events of size. And we're going to look at the propagation now. How well did this propagate north and south? This is ADAC Alaska. And we're seeing the waveform is right off the top of the charts here. Um, we see two sets of waves here. We see some depth again. And now let's look from KC Antarctica. And we see much the same size of signal in KC Antarctica. Now, ADAC Alaska is 4,700 miles away. KC Alaska, or KC Antarctica, is 4,400 miles from the uh, epicenter of the, this earthquake. Approximately, within, within uh, uh, a few miles, 50 miles or so. Uh, again, this is South Karori. Um, near Wellington, near Wellington, um, south end of the North Island of New Zealand. Now, we're looking at the shift that happened around Yellowstone. Not Yellowstone itself, but the faults north and south of it. Long Hollow, Wyoming is due south of Yellowstone, and uh, it's, it's about 100 miles away. Um, I don't remember exactly how far it is, but it's something close to that and look at the reaction that Long Hollow, Wyoming had. This is uh, a lot of single VLF wave um, hits along this fault. This is fault shift activity that we're seeing. It's not tightly spaced, but it's, it's all fault shift. This is the uh, Vanuatu earthquake through here, through the bottom, of, uh, bottom third, bottom quarter, whatever. So lots of activity in Long Hollow, Wyoming. Uh, all around the Vanuatu earthquake. So this is reacted um, because it's, this has happened so many times now with the South Pacific um, that this fault has shifted south of Yellowstone before and after and mixed into the earthquakes that uh, there this is an observable repeatable pattern in science at this point. Bozeman, Montana shows nine hours of VLF waves well before the earthquake and this is what this is another Bozeman Montana seismogram or heli plot rather and it shows the on um, coming out of the VLF waves the onset is up here and it goes through this we've got uh, some other VLF wave activity that's doubled up in here as well, but uh, we've got over an hour of VLF wave activity um, that was in the um, in the 20 hours or so previous to what we see in Bozeman here. So that constant VLF wave activity, off the chart VLF wave activity, causes these vertical lines. It's just over the stylus is writing off the chart over and over and over and over and over. It'll pause for a minute and then it'll start again. Following these VLF waves, um, it's just actually it's not stopping and starting. It's just going up and down, pretty much steady. Um, and it's uh, it's it's uh, creating an effect like a barcode, but it's just due to uh, constant activity, non-stop, pretty much non-stop VLF wave activity. Here in Dagmar, Montana, we've only had this site back for a few days, and we see distant VLF wave activity, which is probably coming from the Missouri River, which probably runs into fault. We can't absolutely nail that information down, but it's uh, the only known fault in the area, uh, potential fault in the area. And this is uh, some 33 miles from the Missouri River. So this was offline for about a month, and now it's back. But we've lost Red Lodge, Montana, which was um, very, very active. It had slowed down before it uh, disappeared, but we don't have it anymore. Now, I, this is, uh, I had to wait until this was available. I carried on assessing other sites, but uh, the body wave was continuing out of this earthquake. This is Kivo, Finland again. And uh, this is the, you can see the P wave in here. So we're going to measure from here and just count how many hours and minutes of propagation we have. And we go one, two, three, four, five, six, that's seven hours and 
7 hours and 10 minutes, 20 minutes. We'll call it 7 hours and 20 minutes. Could be 7 hours and 25 minutes. You could carry it on a little further. Um, 7 hours and 20 minutes of total duration from the onset of the arrival of the P wave to the end of the body wave, which is the uh, crustal shaking that accompanies this earthquake. So that actually is very consistent with a 7.9. And that's what I'm calling that earthquake. I'm calling it a 7.9. That's not what the agencies are calling it. Now, this activity, this is a Yellowstone East Gate site. And this is um, showing uplift earthquakes. And this is around 1800 yesterday. yesterday. Um, so uplift through this area, a couple of lines of it. Um, these are 30, no, they're 15 minutes per line. So we've got uh, about half an hour of uplift signals through here. We've got more here, but uh, these ones are much more significant. So we've had uh, a magma infill in Yellowstone. Uh, it should be no surprise. How large were these? These look large, but you must, with uplift, you must look at propagation. And so I did that. I looked at uh, Flag Ranch, and I looked at a site um, north, of, uh, north of Yellowstone, Mammoth uh, Vault, and uh, Mammoth Vault is 50 miles away, and the Flag Ranch site is 45 miles away. They both showed about a signal about um, oh, oh, about 40, 35, 40 percent of this signal. It was still a large, easily identified signal there. A hundred miles away, this signal did not show at seismogram. So this. Uh, Uplift expends its energy upwards because it's not expending as much energy laterally or sideways in the crust. The crust doesn't shake as hard as a result of the earthquake. Um, and so you get less propagation. But propagation needs to be included as part of the earthquake measurement. And since we have poor propagation beyond 50 miles um, and virtually no propagation or very little propagation at uh, 100 100 miles, um, this, these earthquakes, these uplift earthquakes in series are um, no greater than about a 2.5. Now we also had, so that was uh, the, that was Yellowstone itself, that's the uh, uplift related to what? Of course it's uplift related to magma infill. And uh, that's identified at other sites. That, that's an increase, a little bit of an increase uh, for Yellowstone at that site. Um, there's a couple of other sites that are somewhat busy, but that's the busy one, busiest one in Yellowstone. So not a big widespread increase in Yellowstone, a, a small increase. Monahans, Texas had actually a, a pretty big response to this earthquake, far exceeding that of Yellowstone. Um, this is after uh, this is VLF waves that we saw after the um, the last earthquake in the South Sandwich Islands. We have a small reaction up here, um, and this I don't know if you can make this out or not, but um, these I'm just following the waves with the cursor. These are the VLF waves, about two per minute, um, all the way across this line to here. We've got uh, more VLF waves in here. Um, this is very, and, and more down here. So they're uh, throughout this period, from, from here to here, there's ongoing periods of VLF waves. Uh, so lasting one, two, three, four, five, five hours at this point. Um, very significant. That's, that's a big move. I didn't find those VLF waves at other sites. The VLF waves don't propagate well. Deming, New Mexico had a near 3.0 earthquake. This is the uh, time of the um, Vanuatu earthquake here, so it's just afterwards. That was about a 3.0, and we can tell that by looking at the Cornutus Mountains and seeing that uh, about 100 miles away, it was still propagating a decent signal. Um, we look at San Antonio, it still had a, 
Oh, it's closer, so it had a larger signal, of course. Um, we're not so far away that uh, it's going to make a difference whether we're on the uh, fault direction. Here at the uh, Guadalupe Mountains, New Mexico, we see a weak signal. We also see a lot of uh, small earthquakes. I don't know if these are being reported or not. I haven't looked. There's a lot of small earthquakes. Uh, 1.0s in this this size. This would be about a 2. I uh, know about a 1.5, uh, something like that. Now, Cape Girardeau, Girardeau, I think is how it's pronounced, Cape Girardeau, uh, Missouri, we see the earthquake here, you can see it was a good size, it, uh, trans it propagated a good signal all the way to Missouri, and fault shift followed this earthquake, tied right into it, into the uh, body wave portion of it. Fairfield, Illinois, I don't think it's related, it's... Uh, this is more like a daylight response to and uh, creating uh, increased activity. This is uh, a very active site, uh, Fairfield, Illinois. But I thought I'd show you just because it's so active. Oxford, Mississippi is not such an active site. We've seen uh, breakouts of VLF waves there before, but uh, not so active. And here we see lots of tremors. Um, we're seeing some stress tremors before the Vanuatu earthquake. Stronghurst, Illinois, this is at a farm where uh, the Hardin Midland farm, Stronghurst, we see uh, VLF waves through here of a fault shift. Very, very slow VLF waves, look at that, eh? And uh, here mixed right into the signal and following out of the signal, um, the time of the propagation rather than the time of the earthquake, because it takes a while to get here, but right in the middle of the propagation signal, that comes from Vanuatu, we see that uh, um, the Hardin Lind, uh, the, uh, the Stronghurst, Illinois farm had a, a big, uh, well, a good size fault shift nearby. Calhoun, Georgia had a small reaction coming out of the earthquake, just a small tremor leading into it. Sumter, South Carolina was very busy leading into this and stopped afterwards with a couple of small earthquakes. 1.2, yeah, 1.3 range. Bolivia, North Carolina was also active after the earthquake. Fault shift again. Montrose, Georgia also fired up right after the earthquake with more fault shift activity. Big change. We showed uh, Montrose yesterday, I believe. Also, uh, so it's, it's a very reactive site. Um, Pioneer, Louisiana. Very active after the end of the body wave, uh, at least for this area. Um, we're not seeing the body wave this far inland very well from, uh, from the Vanuatu earthquake. If you're close up to Vanuatu, it would show it large. Ebenezer, Tennessee. Um, has a sticky fault, essentially. Um, it, uh, it accumulates stress and boom, releases. It accumulates more stress and boom, it releases. And it released, in this case, in a four-series tremor event, or you could call it five or six, depending on how you break that up. Another tremor there. And so this force, this uh, site, sticks and moves, sticks and moves. And so when it moves, it moves harder, and you get small earthquakes from it. Other sites that move more easily move more regularly um, is part of moving easily because you grind the sharp edges off. Um, other sites that move more easily don't get the large jolts. This site gets the large jolts. This is Mark Tree, Arkansas, but there's very likely some magma infill involved with this as well. And why? We don't know. But this site is very reminiscent of one of the sites of Mount Shasta, where it has these um, clipped wave bulbous formed signal. So this would be sharp coming down here like this if it wasn't clipped. We would see it uh, probably stretching down about here. But when they clip it off, clip it off like this, we just don't see the whole thing. Um, so that's how it looks from Mark Tree, very nearby at Truman, which is the same as going a little bit east at uh, Mount Shasta, 
we see this mirrored at Mount Shasta, this same signal. And we attribute it to magma infill at Mount Shasta. I believe it's magma infill in this case as well. So interesting that uh, sites on the New Madrid look very much like Mount Shasta seismic sites. Gobbler, Missouri is our last site of the day. Not terribly active. Some light tremors and one small earthquake. And there you have it. Um, a lot of activity. Um, some responses to Vanuatu moving, even in the United States. And uh, it's not that the earthquakes are so large that they're causing a wave to come, to come over and set off faults um, four, five, and 6,000 miles away. That's not going on. But the force that's being exerted to the earth that is enough that it's tilted the axis of the earth, that the earth has a wobble, um, that creates extremes of force. Consider that the uh, equi um, equatorial bulge because of the spin, much if you consider like uh, the Earth as a top, it um, in the center of the spin there's actually more force, and it pulls the uh, crust and the water out a little wider in the center of the Earth along the equator. So that's about 50 miles thicker, right there. The Earth is um, greater in diameter across the equator, going going uh, in diameter, not uh, around it. Um, bigger in diameter, not circumference, in, along the equator than it is elsewhere. And when you make the Earth tilt, um, that's going to put, uh, that's going to shift that bulge. So the bulge has to move with it. But when you create a wobble, that bulge has to wobble back and forth. So that's in some incredible equatorial stress with that um, movement of that. A bulge of water and crust over the course of, of weeks and months that it has to compensate all the time for a new position of the uh, um, actual axis of the earth relative to the sun, the main gravitational body. So the axis keeps changing, that's the wobble that we're talking about, but overall it's tilted greater, more greatly towards the sun. That's all quite researchable. So there's reasons why we're having all of this earthquake activity. And uh, part of this, um, we have to recognize that we've got a near 2,000 times increase in earthquakes um, as a, compared to uh, 15 years ago. Look at the large earthquakes we had, we've had uh, since December 27th. We've had seven, 9.0 and greater up to 9.5 earthquakes in the world. Um, and we've also had about a dozen that are in the uh, eight range, low eight range, um, and even more um, high sevens, of course. That is, a, compared to that 15 year period that ended in uh, 2015, um, we've had over 15 years worth of large earthquakes. And uh, consider they tried to omit even the December 27th Antarctica 9.0 earthquake and that was confirmed later as a 9.0 earthquake. They tried to omit that. No agency reported it. And uh, that's that's a, an incredible omission and if they're going to try to omit a 9.0 earthquake, how many other earthquakes do you think they're omitting? And besides that, how many are they downgrading? They don't want you to know that there's a brown dwarf coming in 20 times the size of Jupiter, that it's causing all of these plate shifts and earth change effects. And what we're leading into, we're leading into that large earthquake prophesied. Um, if you believe this prophecy, you'll understand. And uh, I encourage you to go over to watch Amanda Grace's July 7th prophecy of a large worldwide earthquake. Because every one of the um, Cascade Range volcanic areas has reactivated now through the Aleutian chains, um, through into southern Alaska, down through BC, Washington, Oregon, California, and Mexico. And this 
progression of reactivation is further east than we expected it to see. So it moves, it's, uh, we've got volcanic reactivation east. And then we've seen a massive increase in plate shifts, uh, plate margin shifts all over the world. Um, we saw every one of the Caribbean sites, and we've got lots of sites, heliplot sites in the Caribbean. Every one of them moved for, uh, for an average of eight hours with off-the-chart VLF waves, and that was just a few months ago. Um, never seen that before. And we've had uh, VLF waves um, in Chile, South America, on the other side, uh, Brazil, um, and uh, just incredible VLF waves through the Kermadex for two weeks steady. We're seeing uh, intraplate false shift nonstop blacked out uh, over a month of that from Red Lodge, Montana. Non-stop VLF waves from Dagmar um, and, and Red Lodge, Montana. That was from uh, the 23rd of June up until about a week ago. Um, black right out. Um, and that's incredible fault shift activity to, uh, to be causing that. And it's just so many different places. Now it's Bozeman, Montana. Um, Dagmar has had the same thing where it's been blacked out or near blacked out. I, I don't think it's been black right out, but it's had some very heavy activity. Um, that's three sites just in Montana. Then we've got sites in Wyoming. Uh, we didn't used to see anything uh, of fault shifts south of Yellowstone. So this is new as well. That's, uh, that's new in the last two months. We didn't see that. Um, so things are very dynamic. And why are they dynamic? Well, the last time I saw the uh, brown dwarf on a satellite image, um, it was... Um, about five times larger than the time in, in relation to the sun because it's seen beside the sun, in the corona of the sun. And uh, you need good satellite imagery for that. And then that's what this was from. I, I watched it on Planet X News and it was a June 27th image shown on a later program. And it showed Earth-sized bodies coming with it as well or near Earth-sized planets coming with this brown dwarf. That's 20 times the size of Jupiter. It's five times larger than it was when? About a year earlier when I saw it from on a SOHO satellite image, a NASA-confirmed SOHO satellite image um, the previous year. In a year, it got five times larger in as, as an optical presentation in relation to the sun. So it's comparative analysis using the sun as the constant. It's, uh, it's important. So um, we need to be um, aware of these changes. Um, God is warning us in every way that he can. He's warning us through Amanda Grace Ministries. Um, I believe he's prophesying through her, telling her there's a, a large earthquake coming. Um, the Cascadia is locked and loaded, 80 years overdue. Within this context of a 2,000 times increase of earthquakes and volcanic activity, if you include the seamounts, there's a near 2,000 times increase in volcanic activity as compared to five years ago as well. Um, so things are very incredible. We had New Island blast uh, showed us uh, a plume, stratospheric plume, 53,000 feet just a couple of days ago. Um, just, just. Uh, Etna has been blowing and blowing and blowing, uh, and it's hit over stratospheric at uh, in excess of 40,000 feet as well a, a couple of times. Um, we've had 10, um, I think it's more than 10, but uh, at least 10 volcanoes go stratospheric just since April. Um, we, ne we never used to see this. Um, just such a rarity to see a volcano get to a stratospheric level. Um, it was uncommon for them to get to 30,000 feet. Now, now we're uh, we're seeing fifty thousand feet. It's uh, it's, it's startling. Um, we should be paying attention to this. And what does it mean? We've got the birth pangs of the great tribulation coming up. It's not just earth changes that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, political challenges all over the world, and that needs to be factored in. Um, so, for those that understand, we've got three and a half years of great troubles coming and great persecutions, but it's the end of the time and the time of a great revival through the early period of this because people are going to be shaken awake. This is no time to stay on the fence of apathy 
when all of this changes. Everybody will be shaken in one way or another, and they'll either cry out to evil or they'll cry out to God. And uh, I, I pray that everyone is blessed by God, that they turn to God, they turn in repentance, recognize that God loves them, wants to bless them. That's why he sent his son to die for all of our sins. And uh, he wants us all to go home. So may we all be blessed by turning to God. By turning to God in what comes. I hope you've enjoyed this program, found it informative. If you have, share it with your friends. And uh, give us a thumbs up on your way out if you don't mind. Um, we'll see you next time. Oh, after a short blessing. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your spirit of peace through your Holy Spirit through Holy Spirit, sorry, and that we all receive also the spirit of truth, seeking truth first in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll see you next time on Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports, and more. Bye for now.